Hi everybody, I'm Steve. Um, I guess I already just got a little intro. I work at Jumpstart Lab. We do the best Ruby and Rails training classes on Earth. So if you need to get better at Ruby or Rails, that's what I do most of the time. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about hypermedia APIs. Um, this is relevant because Twilio uses some elements of this kind of design in their current API. Um, and they're, they're big fans internally. Several of the people that work at Twilio are really interested in this space. So that's sort of like why I'm here. This talk isn't directly about Twilio. It's more conceptually about some of the things that Twilio uses. So I won't be saying Twilio very often, even though this is Twilio Conf, I guess is my point. So when you're building an API, um, we have this problem, OK? And the problem is, is that people are fairly good at short-term design and really awful at long-term design. Most don't think they need to design past the current release. And this is a big deal, right? When you're, when you're releasing an API, other businesses are going to rely on you. So you need to make sure that you're able to support them into the future. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is actually a quote, as you can see the quotes around it, from the guy who invented REST, Roy Fielding, as to why he came up with the architecture that he did, uh, which is the architecture that I'll be talking about with this hypermedia stuff. Um, now, the problem is, is hard, right? Like this, is, this idea of long-term design is difficult. And so this, the solution is not big design up front, right? Like we're not omnipotent. We can't tell what's going to happen in the future. So I'm not advocating that you need to fully design everything before you do anything. But there's a middle ground here that's important, I think. So you know, super huge big design up front doesn't work. Um, but neither does not designing at all. Um, we need to balance stuff when we're architects and we're building APIs. We need to think about the differences um, you know, between flexibility and stability, right? So you want to be able to adapt and grow, right? Like lots of people in San Francisco um, have startups. You know, we're constantly adjusting what's going on. I'm an ex-startup founder myself. And so um, you need to be able to react quickly to the market and how your product changes and that kind of thing. But if you're going to be supporting people on top of your API, then you need stability. Because your customers expect that you won't break everything um, whenever you change what your product does, right? So like Facebook is notoriously bad at this. Um, they change stuff out from underneath you all the time. And your code that works last week doesn't work this week. Um, so we have these two big constraints. And we have to figure out how to balance them together. So um, hypermedia APIs are a specific way of, of balancing these things so that you get increased stability without giving up total flexibility, right? Because one of the ways to be stable is to never change. And that's not acceptable. So um, yeah. And I have this quote um, from Karl Marx. Uh, what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect raises his structure and imagination before he erects it in reality. So like, this is our ability to think uh, about our designs and make good choices is what makes us architects. And when you build an API, you have to think like an architect. You can't just mindlessly drone and build stuff. Um, so enough about the problem statement and all that stuff. Um, let's actually, I'll demo um, a, an API that works in this way to sort of show you what I'm talking about. Um, and then we'll talk about the actual constraints later. So um, this is a, an example of an API that was written for microblogging. So like essentially Twitter, right? Small, short status updates. Um, so uh, on the left, we have this git. So we're making a git request to the home page and uh, example.com. And it returns a 200 OK and this link uh, profile. And then it returns this JSON on the side. So this is pretty normal, right? We hit, we hit URLs. We get JSON back. But there's a couple interesting things about this particular response that I want to talk about why this is different than the kinds of JSON APIs you may have been working for previously. Um, we have this template, and it's blank. And it says we need a body and a username, right? So you're not used to getting like, things in JSON that have blank values for the keys. This is a, um, a template to create a new status update. These are the two attributes that we need. We need who said something and what they actually said. Um, you can see above that, there's two statuses that already exist, neato and testing, testing, both written by me. right? So we have this list of statuses, um, this template, and then we also have these links at the bottom. So um, this link has a relation that says what the link is pointing to. And it has um, an href attribute, which is the actual place um, the thing that it's pointing to is. right? So it's sort of like an A tag in HTML, kind of, but in JSON. So this says that the collection is located at the stat slash statuses URL. Um, now we have this template, and we have a collection location. So we can put those two bits of information together, 
and uh, make a post request that actually creates a new status. So we fill out that template with hello hypermedia and my username, Steve Klavnik, and it gives us a 201 created and points to the slash location and gives us a, uh, you know, a 201 has a redirect element. So the location header says slash because that's where we need to go next. So we go back to our home page and now we have three statuses in our list and we still have our template and our links, okay? So these are sort of the, the big defining features. This is what using a hypermedia API looks like. You don't memorize a big list of URLs and you don't memorize a whole bunch of attributes. You uh, use the information that the, the API gives you the information that you need to know. You don't actually need to, to have all of these things hard coded into your client. Um, the server will tell you, these are the things that I need and here's where you send them. And you build everything off of this server response. So um, why does this matter, right? This is a lot of ceremony for what could be memorizing an endpoint and memorizing two attributes and sending stuff. Um, let's talk about um, architecture, right? Where we want to build APIs, you need to know how to architect them. Um, there's a really great Ruby gem called Fog. Um, I don't know how many of you use Ruby, but basically what Fog does is it gives you an interface to all of the different cloud service providers. So you use the Fog gem and you say, oh, by the way, I'd like to use AWS or I'd like to use Rackspace. And it gives you a unified interface between multiple uh, cloud um, providers. So it's fundamentally a, a, a ports and adapters architecture. Um, I don't know if you've seen this diagram or heard of that like software design style before. But basically you have all of your, your core business logic is these, these circles in the middle. And then um, you, know, you may have a web service or your persistence layer um, and they're all separate and interact in this kind of like networked design. So, um, and you can see that there's like the adapters to two other systems, right? So in, in a sense of fog, this would be like AWS versus Rackspace. Um, but you know, you build a unified interface for multiple backends is the idea. This actually happens in our regular code, not just in APIs, right? So if you've heard of the, the law of Demeter before, it's all about um, coupling. Again, this is in Ruby because I'm primarily a Rubyist, so I'm sorry if most of you aren't familiar with Ruby. I decided to keep the example in Ruby because it's pretty easy to read if you're familiar with you know, programming at all. Um, but basically, this is a class called foo, and it stores some data and there's a method called process that calls you know, three nested things um, on foo. So the issue is this part, right? This is, this is bad. And the reason that this is bad is that we've tied the definition of process to the internal details of the bar thing that we passed in. If we change bar later, then foo will break. And that's um, one really good example of how to define coupling in software, is that if, you, if two components are coupled, if you make a change in one component and then it breaks the other supposedly unrelated component, right? And this is fundamentally the stability problem we were talking about earlier. When you have an API and other people write code that depend on you, you want to be able to make changes without breaking their stuff, because um, you want to be nice. So. Um, so this is the issue, is this nested call. Um, and you sometimes hear Demeter referred to as like the law of dots, so there shouldn't be more than one dot on a line, um, which is not strictly what it's technically about. Um, it's actually about types, but, but this is the idea, is that we're coupling ourselves to this internal implementation. You can, uh, you can see this happen if you write tests first. This is why I really enjoy mock-based testing. Um, so in here, we're writing a test for this kind of thing in, in Ruby's um, RSpec language. So we set up a stub bar uh, and we give it a, uh, a quux, which has a stub for the fetch data call. And we expect when we call process, we'll get data back, right? So this is like a really basic test that process works. The problem with this is this nested stub, right? So if you've ever done a lot of mock-based testing, you know that this gets out of hand really, really quickly and it's terrible. So um, you can sort of tell you've broken the law of Demeter once you start nesting your stubs. And this is, this is one reason why I primarily test with mocks rather than test an integration, is because the test is painful and that tells you that your system design is painful. Um, so uh, as I sort of mentioned before, Demeter is actually about types. So if you chaining methods together is really useful, but if you change types in between the things that you change, that's when stuff breaks, right? So if you have a method that works on a string and it returns a string, uh, you can call that on, each, on itself, and since string is the thing that might change, it, it's not going to break everything. But if you have different types, you couple those types together with Demeter. Um, yeah. So ultimately, that whole like thing, not in APIs, in regular software, um, shows us this property, right? 
and this is the this is my favorite way of describing coupling in software is when when things break um, alternately. So relating this to the stability flexi flexibility problem, um, stability means that things don't break over time, and flexibility means that we want the ability to change, right? So we we need to have both of these properties in our systems ideally. Um, so therefore, we need the, the solution to this problem, the flexibility stability couple, uh, problem, is radical decoupling. And I call it radical because most people don't like to think that they write coupled code. Like, if you ask programmers, um, it, you know, do you write code that's coupled? People say, no, coupling is bad. Of course I would never do that. And then they write code that's really tightly coupled, right? Um, one of the things I really dislike about being a programmer and being like on Twitter is that we have these arguments uh, where we memorize these software development maxims, right? Like, oh, you follow solid principles. Like, yeah, of course I obviously follow solid principles. And then we write code and we don't follow any of those principles at all, right? Like, I know that I am a massive hypocrite sometimes because I'm like, oh, I need to get this finished by Friday. You know, it's Friday afternoon. I have two more hours. I know this code is bad, but I'm committing it anyway, right? And then two weeks later, you're like, what idiot wrote that code? And you call git blame, and it always says your name, right? Like, I don't know if that's ever happened to you if you use git. But um, you can say with git, like, who made the last commit on this file? And every time I've done git blame and anger, it's always pointed at myself. And I go, oh, yeah, that's right. Two weeks ago, I wanted to go home early, so I wrote this crap code. And now it's coming back to haunt me, right? So we need to take this idea of decoupling seriously if we want to um, be able to change stuff but not be able to break stuff. And this ports and adapters architecture is one way of making that work. So if our code relies on the adapter, then whenever the other systems change, the adapter changes internally, but the code that uses the adapter doesn't change, right? So um, the client code can stay the exact same, but deal with a new backend because we've had this intermediate adapter. Because in a certain sense, you know, uh, the idea that two different services are shared with the same interface via an adapter is the same thing as two versions of the same service that are di have a different interface, right? The adapter makes them use a shared unified one. Um, so um, Fielding actually talks about this when he talks about REST and um, APIs, is uh, the client-server um, model, right? So the web is built on the ideas of clients and servers. Uh, it's not fundamentally peer-to-peer. -peer. There's distinct uh, responsibilities that are given to the server and to the client, and there's a separation there that exists for a reason, right? This is the, the point in the, the diagram. If you look at these ones, right, the lines are where components talk to each other, and that's the bridge that we need to like, think about um, what we're building with APIs. So it's the same thing with this client-server stuff, right? We have these two components on a line again. So the line is where things can change and where the two parts butt up against each other. Um, so uh, the, that bridge between the client and server is called a media type. So whenever we make a request and we have this accept header that comes back, right? And when we get a response, it has a content type, right? You've seen this in HTTP before. And it says application JSON. Well, what is that, right? Um, it's a, it's a uh, way that the server and client can communicate. So when I say I accept JSON with this request, the server responds and says, yes, by the way, here's some JSON, right? So these things match up, um, and that's the, the gap between these two systems. So um, it's important that they match up, because that way the client knows how to talk to the server, right? If the server spits out a JSON, and the client only understands XML, you're going to have a problem, right? Um, I've been doing a lot of European traveling lately to countries where I don't speak the language. And you know, if, you, if you're not speaking the same thing, uh, problems arise. So, uh, so it's important we speak the same type, but the definition of this type is the bridge, right? So when I say, I speak JSON, do you speak JSON? And you say, yes, I speak JSON. Now we have a means of communicating, right? So um, the definition of JSON then becomes very important because it's the vocabulary that we can use to communicate. So a, a media type definition or a MIME type, if you're talking about H, uh, HTTP specifically, contains all the information that you would need to implement a client or a server in the given type, because it's the intermediary, right? So as a server writer, when you expose JSON in your API, you comply with the JSON RFC, because you want valid JSON. And as the client, you consume valid JSON, right? And you both trust in that shared definition um, to bridge the gap between your client and your server. So um, 
in our earlier example, I sort of glossed over this, um, you know, we have this content type application JSON, and then this link element with a profile um, involved, with rel profile. So if you notice, I talked about this idea of a template and these links attributes over here on the right. None of that is in the JSON RFC, right? So this is not actually like standard JSON. We're relying on these details um, in our shared communication that aren't exposed in the type. So we don't actually have all of that information anymore to build a client and a server of the same type. So um, this profile idea is that we store this document that flavors our JSON in a certain way so that we rebridge that communication between clients and servers. So um, if you would go visit that, um, that profile link, for example, um, it would say, like, this server emits microblogging JSON. Uh, you can expect there to be statuses, templates, and links in the keys. There's a collection relation that describes, you know, the process that I showed you earlier. So this sort of documentation shows that we're serving this particular kind of JSON, and now anybody can read this document and write a client that consumes our API um, programmatically, basically. Like, they can be assured that because we spit out microblog and JSON, any microblog and JSON client can read any server, right? When you have that shared communication, um, you can swap components on either side of the bridge and everything is okay. Now, this sounds like a lot of theory, and it kind of is, and I'm that kind of person, I like theory, but as a practical application of this, um, you know, Google and RSS, right, uh, Google Reader. So if you emit RSS feeds on your blog, and I have one RSS reader, you know, I'm able to talk to any server that emits RSS because they follow the RSS standard. Um, and this gives us the ability to switch out, like, you know, oh, I don't like this kind of RSS reader anymore, I want to use a different one, and that's okay, you know, you don't need to change the RSS that your blog spits out to change RSS readers, right? This seems really obvious when we talk about RSS, but again, with the microblogging example, um, you know, we, we don't have that right now. Uh, people try to re-implement the Twitter API, um, but, you know, so if you have Twitter or, like, uh, a microblogging service like RStatus or Adenica, um, if they shared this microblogging JSON type, we'd be able to switch between TweetBot or Twitter and use any client with any server because they would all share this type, just like RSS. So this is the idea with this, uh, one of the other ideas in this hypermedia type is that um, you would be able to implement multiple clients more easily because they all sh focus on the shared understanding document, um, which is a media type. Uh, in the parlance of the, the REST nerds, this is called independent evolution. And this is how you know that your clients and servers are decoupled, right? You should be able to write a client and a server um, separately from one another with this, this um, documentation is the idea. And this independent evolution is really useful um, because if you are writing a server and a client, you can have two separate teams do that um, independently, right? And they don't necessarily need to immediately talk to each other. Like, I don't need to see your blog to know how to write an RSS parser that will read the RSS that your blog emits, right? We can have no communication about the details because of the shared understanding in the middle. Um, so. Currently, the best that we have is that people just copy tw uh, Twitter's entire API wholesale, and we use that, and then they change it, and everybody's stuff breaks, right? Because it's not in the form of this document where we uh, all come together and standardize on a type. Um, you sort of have to ad hoc try to reintroduce this. And this is a fundamental problem, not necessarily even with Twitter, but almost all the RP um, our APIs that we build. So um, for example, uh, you know, basically, Twitter is an RPC style API, right? If you look at their examples, this is kind of small on the screen, but um, if you look at, uh, you know, these are the things for their tweets, you get statuses timeline, and it returns you a list of timelines. That's no different than a function call. It just happens to be over the internet, right? Which is what RPC is. And RPC is a valid architecture, but the problem with RPC is that it inhibits your ability to be flexible while also maintaining stability. Um, anytime you change something, like if you change the return signature of a method, or if you change where the method's you know, URL is, you break all of the clients because they memorize these details instead of getting them from the server. So sort of as an example of that in code, um, since an RPC is the same thing as regular function calls, you know, maybe we have a reply to tweet method. Um, you know, our client wants to be able to reply to tweets, right? Because that's half the fun of Twitter is like yelling at other people instead of like posting your own statuses. So we would get a list of tweets, we would take those tweets and we'd display them to our user, then we'd display um, the form to get the reply data, and then we'd send the reply by linking in you know, the, the tweet we're responding to and the data that we need to post, right? And this is code that you would reasonably write, right? It makes sense, it's procedural code, it's, it's normal. 
The problem is, is that this has a ridiculous amount of coupling. So the output from the get list of tweets method is this tweets variable, and it gets passed in as the input to the display to user method. And then the return from that and the return from the form to actually show you, you know, type in, you know, you're totally wrong, enter. Um, those both get sent to the supply or to the send reply method. So if anything changes about the internal details of display to user, or if anything changes about the kind of stuff that's returned by the get list of tweets method, our code will break. And that's because we've created this coupling between all of these methods with our business process. So the hypermedia solution, the reason why this links and form ceremony is useful, is that um, business processes can be modeled as state machines, right? So I really loved compilers in college, so I was always into the compilers classes. Uh, so if, uh, if you think about this process, the idea of responding to a tweet, this, um, this thing is a list of steps, right? And there's transitions between each one. As we complete the one, we go to the next step in the process. So it's the same thing with this, like, this is not the state machine of that process. This is just like a good state machine photo. But we have these states, and we have links between the states that we transition in as we accomplish our business tasks. Um, so uh, it's, it's really funny. Uh, right, like you can model website interaction like this too, right? So like I love this XKCD comic about Wikipedia, right? If you've ever gone to Wikipedia and you start clicking links and you follow them, you end up like totally on some other topic and you, three hours have gone by and you don't even know what's going up. But this is also sort of like a state machine. When you visit a website, you know, our user interaction with websites are, are going between pages with these links. So that's the connection between um, and the hypermedia idea is that you can take that business process as a state machine, and instead of making your client duplicate the same business process logic that's on the server, the server can use the links to give the client the business, the next steps in the machine. So now our client doesn't rely on and the knowledge of the internal details of how the server does its work, and we've decoupled the server from the client. Um, so as an example of this working in the real world, and not just my toy hypothetical example, like when you hit a web page in a web browser, right? A web browser does not know anything about Google's internal implementation of PageRank, unless you use Chrome, maybe, <laughs> put something in there. But like Firefox, right? Like it knows nothing about PageRank. But because Google's server uses HTML and it shares with us this idea that we have a form and you need to type in a query and then you press a submit button, um, the client, while know nothing about Google's internals, is able to properly interact with Google's business process. So this is like one example of this working, and we can do that with our own APIs as well, not just via websites, but via programmatic stuff. Um, one of the things that makes this explanation hard uh, is that it's sort of like calculus, right? So it's like another derivative back, right? You're not just building your service, you're building the information about how to use your service. Um, and so in half an hour, unfortunately, I can't like give you even more details. The idea of this talk is to give you some like food for thought, right? Like I'm just up here saying crazy things in the hopes that you'll look them up later because half an hour is just not long enough. I've given a version of this talk that's 75 minutes and I still felt like I didn't have time and I don't want to bore you that long. So, but the point is just that like, you know, I'm skimming over some details and obviously, you know, this is a little strange and probably a little foreign. Um, so uh, it's hard, but it's really interesting too. And uh, yeah, people are, people are starting to actually use this stuff and you're gonna see it in the wild. Um, we call these things um, affordances, the links and forms. Um, so in HTML, we have two big affordances, one of which is a link and one of which is a form, right? A link is sort of just like a way to transition from one state to another, and a form is a way of templating that link to transition to the next state. So they're different, and we can have different ones. This is what's needed to form the, the lines in this graph, right? So if you don't know how to do links and forms, then you, don't, you only have a set of disconnected states, and you don't have the lines that go between them. So you can't share that information with your clients. Um, in my example, I used uh, you know, my own personal like microblogging JSON example. But there are other types that exist that actually have this information already. So if you look at collection plus JSON or HAL, those are two JSON-based media types that know how to do links and uh, forms so that you don't have to like reinvent the wheel because you know reinventing wheels is bad, right? You want to use generic components as much as possible. And um, it turns out that XHTML is a really great media type to use for your APIs, which sounds kind of insane to a lot of people. You're like, what up? My programs, you know, they're not displaying stuff. But HTML has a really rich um, set of affordances built in. So like Comcast's internal APIs 
all use HTML as the primary type to exchange data um, with each other. So um, you know that is definitely a, a possible uh, cool thing to do. Um, now, as far as this example in the real world, um, one area where I think this idea makes a lot of sense is in pagination. So if you've used GitHub's API before, um, they actually share the links to do pagination as link headers. So they have this link and they have this rel next and rel last. And the idea is that you get the link from the page you're currently on rather than constructing your own URLs, right? So this is an example of this idea in the wild with a totally different um, API. Um, when you hit Twilio's API route, it says here are the two versions of the server, the, or service that we have already, right? Here's a link to the root for the first version. Here's a link to the root for the second version. Um, and uh, GitHub is, going to, is increasingly using this kind of stuff. So you'll see them as an example of a leader in this space. Twilio is another one where they keep adding more hypermedia style things to their API. Um, and it's really exciting. There's a couple um, startups that are doing this as well. Um, I had someone today, I got lunch with somebody, and they were telling me that their startup is using all of these ideas. Um, so you're going to start seeing this, examples of this pop up in the wild uh, more and more often. It's sort of a, a it's, it's on the cusp of becoming a big thing. Um, and uh, another real quick um, example of how this uh, changes uh, things is the idea of storing URLs instead of IDs, right? So um, instead of saying, like, this is the tweet with ID2 and primarily working with IDs, you end up working with these links instead. Um, and they have this relation and the, the actual link attribute. So um, this, is, this is kind of neat because it lets us uh, not have to worry about the internal details of how the server identifies its own stuff, right? So um, one of the problems that Twitter had uh, whenever they grew is that um, because IDs were always in numerically increasing order, when people wrote clients, they got lazy and just said, like, sort the timeline by the ID number, OK? And that seems like a totally reasonable thing to make. But when you base your client's um, process off of an internal implementation detail like that, once Twitter reached massive scale and they started having seven digit, eight digit IDs, they needed to be able to generate those. And obviously, it's really hard to do in a sequential order, right? So they couldn't just start using GUI IDs because that would have broken all of their clients that were displaying things in a timeline. And a Twitter timeline that's out of order is like totally ridiculous, right? So they literally had to invent a new algorithm called Snowflake that gives them IDs that are monotonically increasing but aren't necessarily like, you know, uh, inc after each other. So like they had to do all this work later because their clients and their servers were so coupled, right? And that's like a business pr problem that they had to address as they scaled. Um, and that came from people relying on their internal business, you know, uh, the, relying on the details of how the server implements its own stuff. Uh, and as an example of this coupling. And in my l I have a minute, so I'm just going to super skim over this thing. There's a really interesting idea called the hypermedia proxy pattern. And basically, it lets you compress information uh, so that you don't need to make as many um, API requests, right? Because one of the things that people say about this kind of thing is like, oh, well, that's a lot of requests. So um, you can actually write your code in such a way that if you have data, like a body and a name, but you only return the body, you can write your client code so that it dynamically only visits the link if the data doesn't exist. And uh, I only have one more minute, so I'm just going to skip over this example rather than going farther into it. But there are ways of mitigating the number of HTTP requests, which is one of the first things that people assume when they see this kind of API is like, I'm going to make a lot more requests than I used to. So there's, there's interesting techniques to get around that kind of thing. Um, Anyway, so uh, thanks for listening to me uh, you know, give you an overview of this kind of thing and a little bit of theory. Like I said, uh, if you have questions, I'm at Steve Klabnik on Twitter. Um, there's a, a mailing list that I have specifically for people that are new to this idea that want to uh, build these kinds of APIs. So it's uh, hypermediateliberalist.com. And I have a book project where I'm like writing a book about this stuff. Um, I have a new blog at words.steveclabnick.com that's kind of cool. And uh, all of our curriculum with Jumpstart is uh, online at tutorials.jumpstartlab.com. So uh, you know, if you're looking to get a little better at Ruby and Rails, we have tutorials from beginner stuff to advanced stuff, and that's really useful. Um, so check it out and give me some feedback. But this is, uh, this is how you can get a hold of me. So thanks for listening.